Hi everyone. So uh, yeah, apparently I've got a little bit longer than I originally anticipated um, to speak about uh, nickel and particularly nickel sulfate. So my name is Alex Lahn. Um, I work for CRU. Uh, for those of you who don't know us, CRU are a market leading um, company that provides uh, research into the metals and mining and fertilizers industries. Um, we, the, the largest part of our business puts out publications that people could subscribe to that talk about throughout the value chain for, for key commodities. Um, but we also have a consulting department, that's the department I've worked in for the last 10 years, um, which puts together single client reports for, um, for specific clients to help, them, to help them make their decisions and often to, to, in support of project financing. So we've been working over the last two years quite extensively in the technology metals sector. And we've got a broad team um, with a wide range of experience covering lithium, cobalt, nickel, and also having people who are experienced in the policy and energy markets who can provide us with forecasts and predictions and, and input with respect to the EV uh, and other battery segments um, that we can then use in a consistent manner to analyze the, the battery metals underneath them. Um, so today I'm going to talk through, uh, provide a little bit of introduction and background and why people should care about nickel sulfate and why they do. Um, talk about our EV uptake forecasts and um, our demand for nickel sulfate. Then talk about the supply response we've seen so far and what we're expecting in the near term and, and, and what's likely to be needed beyond that. And then finally talk about the cost of new capacity and the implications for, for pricing that that brings about. Um, so first up, the uh, yeah, it's a bit of introduction. I think nickel sulfate's been quite key. It's been quite an interesting little segment because people have thought that it might bring about a big split in the nickel market because battery demand has been growing very quickly and is expected to be growing very quickly for, for nickel in general. The chart on the bottom right there shows um, we're expecting growth even between 2017 and 2022, and it's only going to accelerate beyond that, to be pushing along at almost 20% um, on average per year for, for nickel in batteries, which compares to you know, 2, 3, 4, 5% in, in most of the other end uses for, for nickel. Obviously, the largest of those is stainless steel. Now, at the same time, on the supply side, the significant majority of recent supply additions and those that are expected in the, the, the near future are coming in the form of NPI, nickel pig iron. Now, that is broadly only, only really useful for stainless. So people are, are saying, well, if we've got all this demand for nickel in batteries, but most of the supply side that we're seeing come on stream is, is not suitable for that end use, then at some point that's going to cause a split in the market somehow. Um, and the, the, a split in particular between stainless and non-stainless -stain supply and demand. Um, but I think we think the situation is going to be a bit more complicated than that. I'm going to try and get through that uh, within this presentation. So um, we, but once we've come up with our EV forecast, which I'm not going to go into an astonishing amount of detail, but we, we're considering key aspects around policy, particularly in China, um, and also make some calculations for total cost of ownership of different vehicle types, battery electric vehicles, hybrids, and ICEs in different regions. Um, to sort of draw out conclusions as to how EV uptake might develop over time. But once we've come up with those numbers, we need to think about the battery chemistry of those uh, EVs themselves. So firstly, uh, just showing here in China and North America, in China there's LFP batteries, and on the battery panel earlier people were talking about this. Uh, LFP batteries contain no nickel, lithium ion, phosphate, they are. Um, they hold a reasonable amount of share in China at the moment, but we would expect that to be uh, gradually phased out as the market grows and NMC batteries of increasing nickel intensity take a greater share. Uh, in North America, we've got NCA batteries taking up a good share of the market at the moment, but that will also diminish as the market grows and NMC batteries uh, take, take a greater share as well. Now, one thing that's been noted um, quite widely is that these, these new NMC batteries are broadly expected to be more nickel intensive. Now, Whilst that certainly does uh, contribute to, to a growing nickel intensity per, per kilowatt uh, of, of a new battery, it's worth noting that it's not necessarily a one-for-one -one addition because at the same time, these more nickel intensive batteries generally have a larger energy density, so you don't necessarily need to use um, the same volume of an 811 cathode, for example, as you would to get the same level of output as you would in a 6 to 2 to 2 kind of, uh, kind of battery. So, it's uh, that, that additional nickel intensity is offset by the higher energy density of the battery itself. But certainly it's a, it's a, it's an, a factor which assists in nickel demand growth uh, alongside the broad uh, growth in the EV market itself. The other thing we need to think about is the battery capacity of different EVs. So if you see a forecast in front of you that's got 10 million 
Uh, EVs, you need to think about, firstly, are these battery electric vehicles? Are they plug-in hybrids or are they hybrids? Because as this chart shows, there's a huge difference between the battery capacity of those vehicles. And that battery capacity is roughly proportional to the amount of materials, the raw materials they'll need to use to make them up. So even within the battery electric vehicle segment, we've got a huge range between your highest end Tesla with about a 100 kilowatt hour battery versus um, this sort of sub-segment sub of battery, uh, battery electric vehicles within China that have been really quite popular over the last 18 months or so. But they only have a 20 kilowatt hour battery. So that's, we're talking about roughly a fifth, of a, a fifth as much uh, nickel, lithium, and cobalt in one of those cars relative to your highest end Tesla. Um, those, the popularity of those vehicles has been diminished slightly in recent months because China has rolled back some of the subsidies that were available on shorter range vehicles, which unsurprisingly these, uh, the lower battery capacity vehicles are, uh, that they have. So their uh, popularity has been impact somewhat, um, but, but they're still proving quite a popular little sub-segment of the market. So it's important to think about that overall weighted average battery capacity of different vehicles when you're looking into raw material demand. Um, so as I mentioned here on the chart on the left-hand side, we've got sort of a, a reference, a base case, uh, battery electric vehicles, full battery electric vehicles sales um, globally um, on the left-hand side. So in, in that sort of base case, we're, it's, I think it's a little bit conservative than the relative to quite a few market uh, observance. It's maybe around 6 million battery electric vehicles by 2025. We've also um, made a, a greener scenario where we, we factor in more aggressive uh, policies around the world, but especially in China. Um, and under that scenario, we've got EVs, battery electric vehicles, increasing up to 13, 14 million units by 2025. At the same time, it's really important to note that it is all about China, as was mentioned on the panel earlier. Chinese contribution to new EV sales, especially in the short term, you see how that dotted line increases in 2019, 2020. Chinese share of global EVs is, is increasing very substantially. It's really important towards the, the near-term outlook, particularly whilst we... Whilst the total cost of ownership of a battery electric vehicle remains a fair bit higher than an ICE in most regions, we're dependent on subsidies or supply side uh, policy to, to sort of force that in the near term. And, and the, the credit quota policy in China that is encouraging uh, automakers to substantially increase the number of EVs in their fleet is, is really key to EV growth in the next two, three years. And what that means for nickel sulfate demand is, is quite dramatic. I mean, we're expecting under the base case to see almost a four times, uh, four times the demand for nickel sulfate in 2025 relative to 2017, and under the green scenario, almost six times the demand. So there's no doubt that nickel sulfate demand is increasing very substantially driven by these EVs, but the extent to which of, uh, the extent of that demand growth is very much dependent on what you believe about the EV story in the future. Um, so what does that mean on the supply side? Well, on the left-hand side here, we've got a chart of nickel sulfate capacity um, and that's sort of in terms of projects that exist now and that we know about um, growing over the next few years. So we're expecting output by, well, sorry, capacity by 2022 to be effect effectively double that of 2017. Um, and that is still very heavily weighted towards China, Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan. Um, but you can see that their share of the overall market is in one of the few situations, few commodities uh, related to the, the battery segment is expected to diminish a little bit by 2022 based on projects that we know about. But a large part of that is, uh, is BHP adding nickel sulfate capacity to their smelter in West Australia. And you can see that, that that Australian share of that bar increases quite a little bit towards the end. And on the right-hand side here, what we're effectively doing is overlaying the demand forecast on the previous slide against that known uh, capacity additions out to 2022. So what we're showing is, is in the base case that capacity increase that we know about may, may well keep us covered for the next, in terms of meeting demand for the next uh, three or four years, uh, out to maybe 2022. But beyond that, even in the base case, we would expect to need new capacity to avoid the market falling into a substantial deficit. Now in the more aggressive green scenario, the, even that doubling of capacity over the next five years barely covers uh, requirements through for the next couple of years. Um, and beyond that, we see, we see demand growing very, very substantially. So, Again, um, that level of capacity is, is, enough to is potentially enough to cover us under a conservative scenario, is enough to cover us for a few years. But under any scenario, we're definitely going to need more nickel sulfate capacity beyond that which we already know about. Now, what might that sulfate capacity look like? And I think one of the key things to take away from this presentation maybe is that there's a lot of ways to produce nickel sulfate uh, more than people might imagine. I think a lot of people perceive that you take, um, which is kind of what this first category here do, your finished nickel dissolvers, you buy class one uh, nickel, usually in the form of powder, but sometimes in pellets or briquettes, 
and you simply dissolve that in sulfuric acid. Um, so you're buying essentially a finished product and then converting it into nickel sulfate. Um, now this is, is quite a popular uh, route for, for production, but the operating costs on an overall basis are always going to be quite high. The conversion cost to convert um, nickel powder into sulfuric acid is not very high, but obviously the cost of buying the powder in the first place is very substantial. Now the, um, and there's various people who are doing this generally on a small scale and generally within China, but also some, in, uh, some producers of that nature in Korea and Taiwan as well. Now the next category of producers are integrated sulfide smelters. So these are the people who have been producing um, sulfide concentrates from their deposits for, for many years, um, but have recently or, or are in the process of adding sulfate capacity to convert the mat that they would get from their sulfide smelters into nickel sulfate. Now that includes Jinchuan in China, Jilin Jian also out there, um, Norilsk in Russia, they ship the, the mat to Finland to be converted and some of that gets turned into sulfate and BHP are adding a very substantial amount of sulfate capacity to their uh, smelter in West Australia. The next category we have to think about are recyclers. Um, so these are guys who are using for the majority of their feedstock, but not necessarily all of it, it will be bolstered by refined nickel and other intermediates um, to convert that either using pyrometallurgical or hydro processes into a nickel sulfate. GEM and Umacore are the largest guys in, on, on this side of things. Um, now each of the three, that are three sort of categories that I've just meant will add um, capacity that will help to meet demand, uh, but in the long, well, but, but there are limitations that, that prevent these, these kinds of projects from necessarily meeting all of the demand growth that we're expecting, particularly as we move out to the longer term. Now, in part, that's because, especially for the, the integrated sulfide smelters, they're all, the, a significant number of these guys are adding sulfate capacity, and that is therefore moving nickel units that would have gone to supply the stainless or other markets into, into the battery segment. Um, but in the long term, there's been very little large-scale, high-grade sulfide or deposits discovered in the last 10 or even 20 years. Um, and as such, the, the longer-term availability of, of, of a new sulfide smelter that might help to meet sulfate capacity is pretty, is pretty limited. And at the same time, we can't necessarily move all of the Class one material from these kinds of producers of going into stainless out of those end uses because there's a, a technical minimum that is still required there. Um, on the recycler front, there's a limitation on the, the it's going to be some time before we see the, the large amount of nickel in batteries, particularly being used in, in battery electric vehicles. It's going to be, you know, 10 years before that starts to come back in significant volumes because, the, because of the lifespan of those vehicles and, and because the, the size of that pool is not yet very substantial. So that leads us to believe that we're looking at two real um, potential end uses, oh, sorry, potential routes to sulfate supply for being the key, um, the key additions that would help to, uh, help to come on and meet sulfate demand growth in the future. The first of those being hydromet based um, operations. So here we would take a, a lower grade laterite nickel ore and run that through a hydrometallurgical, often an HPAL, but sometimes a leach, leaching process to produce a mixed hydroxide precipitate and that's mixed nickel cobalt. So the cobalt uh, Cobalt byproducts are quite important, especially on, on the back of the big cobalt price boom we've seen over the last two years, are important for this uh, processing route. Sumitomo is the, in Japan is the key example of this. They get a significant amount of material from the two uh, HPAL plants they majority own that are based in the Philippines. They take the, the intermediate from those, the MHP there, and convert that into a variety of end uses, but especially sulfate, and they are, I think, f at least for now, they're still the largest individual nickel sulfate producer. Um, but, but here what's really important is that the, whilst it doesn't cost a lot of money to convert the intermediate to sulfate, nor indeed to put the capex in for that uh, back-end sulfate capacity, the capex for the hydro plant in the first place is extremely high, um, as much as fifty, sometimes $70,000 a ton of installed capacity. So that's the key issue with, um, with that sort of potential uh, route to, to sulfate production. So the last of these is um, a route which has actually been quite interesting. Just, in the, just There was an announced project just at the start of this week um, where Tsingshan, who are a very large MPI producer uh, with operations in China and, and also in Indonesia, GEM, who are the, re the nickel recycler or sulfate, re sulfate producer from recycled sources I mentioned earlier, and also CATL, the, the, the largest uh, Chinese battery, uh, lithium-ion battery producer, uh, have announced a joint venture together with some other players to produce nickel sulfate in Indonesia. And our understanding at this stage, although there's very little details around it, is that they would use this, this via NPI route, where you would take again a laterite ore, you would smelt it in a furnace, 
to produce what is effectively a molten NPI type material, nickel pig iron. Um, but then you would run that through a sulfidation converter um, in order to produce a low grade nickel mat. And then that mat would be processed into nickel sulfate. Now those additional steps in the capex of adding that sulfidation converter are relatively, compared to some of the other uh, options for converting an intermediate or a finished product into, into nickel sulfate, are relatively high. But one of the benefits that you get out of that are that you can potentially move your nickel units into either NPI or sulfate, depending on what the market is, requires at any one time. So for those last two slides, I've got a bit, bit more detail in terms of the individual breakup of, uh, breakdown of costs. Um, so the left-hand waterfall chart here is, is for a new hydro plant based on sulfate capacity, it's just a roughly building up for a, for a representative plant based in Southeast Asia, how those, uh, the overall costs might look, including CapEx to work out sort of an incentive, what the LME price would look like for those projects to, to make sense. So firstly, if we look at the, the OPEX on the left-hand side, that's, we estimate that to be a bit more than $10,000 a tonne. Um, but when you look at that capex, that's a huge additional chunk for, for adding the initial hydro plant in the first place. Um, and as I sort of mentioned before, the, the, the two other red uh, blobs, the conversion to sulfate, opex, and capex, are not too substantial in comparison to those initial hydro costs. Um, and at the same time, you're getting uh, significant byproduct credits for your cobalt content. Um, and when you factor in the nickel sulfate premium of LME, which I think at the moment is maybe $4,000 a ton, and is varied between somewhere around 2500 to maybe four and a half or above, uh, $1,000 a ton over the last few years. When you factor that in as well, then your incentive price for a new hydro plant is not, as some might have feared, up around $20,000 a ton, but is maybe sixteen or $17,000 a ton, depending on the assumptions that you make. And because those assumptions are quite important for, your, for where that number ends up, I've shown on the right-hand side chart the variance in that incentive price, depending on if you believe some people are, are talking about investing in hydro plants in Indonesia that they believe they'll be able to put up at a significantly lower capex than what we've seen hydro plants go up for in recent experience. Um, talking about maybe $30,000 a ton of uh, installed capacity rather than fifty to $70,000 a ton, so a huge difference. And unsurprisingly, if you, if you make the assumption that those plants would otherwise look the same but would have lower capex, then that brings down that incentive price to maybe only a little above $10,000 a ton for that sort, of, uh, that sort of an operation. And in the furthest right part of this chart, you can also see that the uh, incentive price is obviously quite, quite heavily exposed to the sulfate premium as well. If you believe that the sulfate premium would, will grow and the market for nickel sulfate would be extremely tight, um, if the premium went up to say $6,000 a ton, then that would very substantially bring down the incentive price for uh, the, the implied incentive LME price for a new hydro plant. However, there is also the possibility, it's a bit of an outside chance, I think, that the sulfate premium could be diminished rapidly and that's if we see a lot of integrated producers of sulfate come into the market whose costs are below the LME price um, and they can do enough to fulfill demand, then there's the implication that the sulfate premium could drop quite substantially. But at the moment, as long as we're always going to have some of those producers who are buying finished nickel and having to convert that into uh, nickel sulfate, then their costs are always going to be above the LME and you will always see a, a premium for sulfate above that. So the last sort of content slide here I think I have is looking at the via NPI route, so the, the pyrometallurgical smelting of laterite ores to produce an iron nickel alloy, which is converted into a mat and then converted into sulfate. On the left-hand side, we've got a rough build-up, and because this route isn't really widely used, I think there's certainly some uncertainty about, uncertainty about these all-in costs. But we've tried to show that in the blue area is sort of your OPEX and CAPEX for a new NPI plant, and then top of that, the pink and dark red areas are your OPEX and CAPEX for the conversion to sulfate. And as you can see, they add quite a bit to the, uh, the overall uh, price. And the, the yellow dot is, is showing that when you add in, add, is adding back the sulfate premium basically to that. But you can see that in China, for, a, for an approximate representative plant, the probable all-in costs of, of a new NPI plant that you would then tack on sulfate capacity on the back is pretty high and probably prohibitive because that overall cost is coming in comfortably above two or twenty thousand dollars a ton, and nickel prices have we saw, I think they touched uh, almost $16,000 a ton earlier this year, and that's the highest they've been for probably four or five years. And they're back down to maybe $12,000, $12,000, dollars $13,000 a ton at the moment. But if you look over at Indonesia, um, the, the much lower cost of producing NPI in the first place suggests that um, that all-in incentive price for sulfate is not, is comparative to some of the other process routes and is not necessarily prohibitive. But one thing to factor in, on, that's what I'm trying to show in these right-hand charts, is that unless there is a very substantial nickel sulfate premium and or a big discount on MPI relative to LME, uh, then 
it arguably makes more sense to just continue to produce MPI rather than producing sulfate because those additional conversion costs are potentially greater than the difference in the price of the products in the first place. So we'd need to see a larger uh, premium in the chemical market to in incentivize that sort of capacity. That said, the, uh, the announcement from Singshan GM and CATL earlier this week is, is suggesting that people are certainly very strongly considering this route uh, for, for potential production, which is a uh, very interesting development. Um, so finally, one slide just to try and sum up what I've been talking about so far. We certainly believe that nickel sulfate demand will continue to grow very rapidly, um, and the extent to which that will grow is dependent on your view on the EV story. Um, and whilst we've already seen a strong supply response and a lot of that new capacity coming in at existing sulfide smelters, Jinchuan, BHP uh, in particular, we do believe that more sulfate, uh, more greenfield sulfate capacity will be required. Um, the extent that that will be required is dependent not only on your demand view, but also on um, how much material we can move out of the class one that is currently being used in the stainless sector into battery end uses instead, um, and also the extent to which the recycling of nickel wastes in the form of batteries and other wastes can, can also help out with meeting new sulfate capacity. But I think we would believe that under most scenarios, we're definitely going to need additional capacity beyond that. And there's the two principal routes it will come down will be this sort of via NPI route or and or the hydromet route. And either of those are not necessarily quite as expensive in the sort of the plus $20,000 a ton range that some people might have expected, but are still nonetheless higher than where nickel prices are at the moment. So the requirement for this new capacity brought about by, by increasing nickel battery demand will provide some support to prices, we would say, in the medium to longer term as well. But, but we don't see that um, this trend will sort of tear the market in two between stainless and non-stainless end uses in the way that some people have talked about. Um, and I think that's about it. I did have one other slide that I took out uh, which showed that our EV forecasts dramatically tick up beyond 2025. So for the most part in this presentation, I've been only talking about sort of the next five to seven years. Um, but beyond that, uh, the, the, this trend is only going to pick up in pace. So, so the impact on the market will, will grow more and more substantial. Thanks, Alex. Um, so you, you, overall, very bullish on the EV front. Um, I, thinking back to the comment that you had around um, the extent to which you believe in the EV story and the sort of hype that's going on around it. But the view from crew is very much... Um, um, I think yes and no. I would say that our, compared to a lot of other market participants, our view on the total number of EVs of all category is relatively conservative. We're probably towards the lower end. Where we might be a little bit more bullish is that we've got a larger share of battery electric vehicles in there compared to plug-in hybrids and mild hybrids. Um, and as I sort of showed on that chart earlier, that leads to a proportionally larger demand for lithium, nickel, cobalt, and everything else per vehicle than, than you might see in a more hybridized scenario. And if, is, there, um, is there anything sort of um, value in talking about away from the EV story? demand factors on nickel from you know uh, more more traditionally uh, stainless steel production that sort of thing for sure and i think much growth there at all? yeah something that i think um chris berry said on the panel earlier is that movements in demand for nickel uh in in the battery segment aren't enough to move the needle at the moment when it comes to price and i would say from a fundamental perspective that's absolutely true a, a, a one percent two percent change in demand for nickel in stainless has, in an immediate sense, a much good is, is equivalent to you know a thirty percent shift in in batteries. Um, so in the short term, and I think I think you've seen the nickel price bounce around. Uh, there's been some investor excitement about um, the battery segment. Uh, that if that if that's leading you to invest in the nickel uh, into existing nickel stocks um, in the hope that they will go up because of battery demand, that's probably a little bit optimistic. Um, and we've seen that in the the you know. The price has come down based far more on fears, you know, the, from that $16,000 a ton earlier in the year, based on fears around a trade war and sort of a, a generally slightly negative view of the overall global macroeconomic sector. We'll move the price a lot more around than a new battery plant or an exciting development in the battery space for sure. But th so that's why I think a lot of the trends in this are, are talking at least out to, you know, we're talking beyond 2021, 2022 at the very least for this to become a, a really significant factor. But Battery demand as a as to, batteries as a total um, demand for nickel at the moment, I think is maybe somewhere around five percent um, of the overall market. So obviously it's only a tiny share at the moment, but 
we definitely believe that it, that, that will be growing and that will grow quickly. And maybe if you look out, I think, I think I saw a forecast maybe for 2030, 2035, that batteries could be as much as 30% of the nickel market. So a much more substantial share. Okay, excellent. Um, was there, did anyone else have any questions uh, for Alex? Um, regarding ladder, ladder rates, uh, you, you, you mentioned several times that's a source. Um, how reliable is that? Than as a source, like I mean, we've heard, you know, various projects have had difficulties and such like that. I mean, how do you see that? Um, yeah, it's a question. I think that, that, and there seems to be a lot of, well, so yeah, laterite ores. I think uh, yeah. So the, the two routes, I suppose, from a from a production of nickel pig iron as as used in China, it seemed pretty reliable. They've been able to deal with widely varying um, sources of different laterite ore from both Indonesia and the Philippines, particularly whilst Indonesia had the very stringent. Uh, ban on the export of ores. Their feeds have changed quite substantially and they've still been able to output nickel pig iron for use in their domestic stainless industry without a great problem. Um, that's less the case, I think, for ferro-nickel producers who are try obviously trying to produce a higher grade nickel, essentially the same product but with more nickel in it. Um, particularly if you think about Connie Ambo, they had significant capex overruns and I think the, the, the specialization of that particular furnace to the ore deposit that it's based by is, it, it does make, make its use quite challenging. But I would say the, the, the challenges around use of laterite through that NPI route for then sulfate are not too, don't seem to be too dramatic. But from a hydro perspective, yeah, very challenging. Way more, um, way more technolo technologically uh, involved. I think most of the hydro processes are designated to, they're specified to a single ore source, so they can't, they've got no adaptability to use a different uh, source of ore if they're mined. You know, they can't really be a third party standalone. They need to have the mine there. Um, and yeah, I think, the average over recent hydro plants and recent being the last, I don't know, five, 10 years is that they've taken four years to get up to maybe 80% capacity utilization. So that obviously substantially impacts your, the economics of how your project looks if, if you can't accelerate that ramp up. Um, and they've had large capital cost overruns, many of them as well. But I mean, I think some people have just had the sort of the China will fix it <laughs> view. Um, and yeah, we're aware of plenty of people who are looking at um, very early stages, but, but early stages for hydro plants based in Indonesia that would be predominantly aimed at uh, sulfate operation. And I think hopefully in the presentation showed that that's certainly a, an easier argument to make um, than it for, based on sulfate operation than it would be to produce a, a finished nickel product, a, a, a refined nickel product that is. Um, but nonetheless, there's definitely some technical uncertainty and they talk about having significantly lower capex than recent experience. And I don't really know what that's based on. Um, there isn't a huge amount of detail around these projects that would enable us to, to be confident in those assumptions. So there's definitely some uncertainty around it, but they've done it before, they'll do it down. maybe they'll do it again. Okay, any further questions um, for Alex while well, we've got him here? Okay, in that case, uh, let's have a round of applause, please. Thank you.